Sunday, July 26, 2020, Monaco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. So last weekend, uh, I covered the first letter uh, by William Cobbett in Paper Against Gold, this uh, book here, which has a collection of William Cobbett's uh, letters that he wrote for a pamphlet while he was at Newgate Prison back in uh, the early 1800s, I think 1810 to 1812. And I'm going to continue with his letters. Today's letter is the second letter. And he's talking about what are the funds and stocks and national debt. So that's what I want to go over. Uh, he goes over the creation of the national debt. And I think it's really important for us to know what the national debt is, especially uh, with what's going on today with governments uh, in the United States, in the UK, in Europe, everywhere around the world, ramping up the national debt. Uh, by the way, I'm sitting on Billy's couch. He's next to me. Uh, he's probably going to fall asleep while I do the, the reading. So let's go then. Some of you have asked me because uh, in yesterday's video, I was sweating. My glasses, unfortunately, fog up a little bit, especially in my right eye. Uh, there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, we don't have air conditioning here in the UK, most of the houses, because most of the year it's not that hot. It's only a few weeks uh, during the year. So I do have a, a Dyson air purifier, and that cools the place down quite a bit. The only problem is that it's too noisy. So I've had to turn it off. So hopefully <laughs> I won't be uh, sweating too much, but it is a little cooler today. So let's go through the reading. I'm going to take my glasses off because it's easier to uh, read through. Um, I've read this letter already the other day. Um, and it's very interesting uh, because we think of um, the national debt as something uh, that is completely uh, separate from things, but uh, he explains it very well, how it's connected to taxation, how it's connected to the central bank. Uh, and my conclusion is that without one of those three, you can't have all three. So without uh, the central bank or without taxation, you can't have the national debt. And you wouldn't have the national debt if we didn't have a central bank or taxation. So there you go. Let's go through letter two. What are the funds and stocks and national debt? Necessity of clearly understand what these words mean. Meaning of them, inquiry into the origin of the funds and debt. The English Revolution, Act of Parliament, fourth, William the uh, third, begins the funding and debt system First loan to government, nature of funds and stocks and national debt, explanation of how money is put into the funds, illustration in the case of Messrs. Muckworm and Company and that of Farmer Greenhorn, the funds shown to be no place nor anything of a mystical nature. So he's talking about the funds, what they are. So this is just an introduction to the letter. So let's begin with the letter. Gentlemen, having in the foregoing letter taken the sketch of the history of the Bank of England and of its notes from their origin down to the time when the bank stopped paying its notes in gold and silver, the next thing to do in our regular course of proceedings will be to inquire into and clearly ascertain the cause of that stoppage. So uh, he's talking about in 1797 when the Bank of England uh, stopped paying in specie or coin their banknotes. Because banknotes, of, co of course, are promissory notes to pay in silver coinage or in gold coinage. For it is very evident that without ascertaining this cause, we shall not be able to come to anything 
like a decided opinion with regard to our main question, namely whether there be any probability that this bank will be able to return to their payments in gold and silver, in which question every man of us from the highest to the lowest is so deeply interested. So yeah, this was in 1810. They had um, discontinued or they had suspended like Nixon did convertibility of Bank of England notes since 1797. So it had been 13 years since they had um, suspended that convertibility. So this is what he's discussing here in 1810. But it is necessary for us to stop a little where we are and not go on any further with our inquiries into the cause of the stoppage at the Bank of England until we have taken time to look a little at the funds and the national debt. These are the words which are frequently made use of. So he's basically saying we need to look uh, exactly uh, at what those two words or two terms mean, funds and the national debt. But like many other words, they stand for things which are a little understood and the less perhaps because the words are so very commonly used. As in the instance of Shrove Tuesday or Shrove Tide, words which we all, from the oldest to the youngest, make use of. But as to their meaning, we content ourselves with supposing or appearing to suppose that they contain a commandment for us to eat fritters and pancakes and to murder poor unoffended cocks, whereas they mean the Tuesday or the time for going to confess our sins to and to get absolution from the priests, to shrieve, being a word equal in meaning to confess and shrove to confessed, and the use of them in the case here mentioned, having been handed down to us from the days of our forefathers, when the Catholic worship was the worship of the country. So he's trying to make an analogy of how people just use words and a lot of times they don't really know what it means. Monstrous, however, as is the perversion of the meaning of words in this instance, it is scarcely more so than in the case of the funds and the national debt. But there is this very important difference in the two cases that while in the former, the perversion is attended with no mischief to either individuals or to the nation. In the latter, it is attended with great mischief to both, with the ruin and misery of many a thousand of widows and orphans, with woes unnumbered to the nation at large. But if a right understanding of the meaning of these words be, in all cases where words are used, of some consequence, it is of peculiar consequence here. As may have been gathered from the preceding letter, we shall find the funds and stocks and the national debt to be closely interwoven with the banknotes as to be quite inseparable therefrom in every possible state or stage of their existence. So think of uh, Bank of England notes or Federal Reserve notes. The word fund means a quantity of money put or collected together. The word stock as applied to such matters has the same meaning. Both words may admit of meanings somewhat different from this, but this is the meaning which plain men commonly give to these words, and it is, too, the fair and sensible meaning of them. Now we shall presently see in what degree this meaning belongs to what are commonly called the funds or the stocks, into the origin and progress of which we are now going to inquire. 
and an inquiry it is worthy of the undivided attention of every true Englishman, every man who wishes to see the country of his forefathers preserved from ruin and subjugation. Strong words. Soon after the English Revolution, that is to say, soon after our ancestors, who had too much spirit to be dragooned out of their liberty and their property, had driven away King James II and had brought over the Prince of Orange and made him uh, in his stead and had at the same time taken measures for stripping the family of Stuart of the crown forever and putting it upon the heads of his present uh, majesty's family. Soon after this revolution, the existence of funds, stocks, and the national debt began. Under the auspices of the same Prince of Orange, who was then become our King William III, and who appears to have lost but very little time in discovering the effectual way of obtaining money from the English without resorting, as the Stuarts had, to those means the use of which had ever and excited commotions against them, which had brought one of them to the scaffold, which at last, after driving another from the land, had forever stripped them of their crown. The real motives for creating a national debt we shall, by and by perhaps, have occasion to notice, but at present our business is to get at a clear notion of the way in which it was created. William III was hardly seated upon the throne before a war was begun against France, and in the fourth year of his reign, being the year 1692, an act of Parliament was passed imposing, and I quote, certain rates and duties upon beer, ale, and others, liquor, liquors, for securing certain recompenses and advantages in the said act mentioned to such persons as shall voluntarily advance the sum of 10,000 pounds. 10,000 pounds, that's a million pounds, towards carrying on the war against France. This is the title of the act, being chapter 3 of the fourth year of William and Mary. These are the very words and fatal words they were to England. In the body of this act, it is enacted that the persons who shall advance the million of pounds shall out of the rates and duties imposed by the act receive a certain interest or annual payment for use of the money so advanced. They were to have and they had their money secured to them by way of annuity for life or lives, and they were to have certain advantages in cases of survivorship, and the annuities were to be redeemed up on certain conditions and at certain times. But it will be quite useless for us to load our subject with a multitude of words, entering the changes upon all the quaint terms which, as appertaining to these matters, have one would think been made use for for no other purpose than that of confusing the understandings of plain men. The light wherein to view the transaction is this. The government was, no matter how or from what cause, go into war with France, and for the alleged purpose of pushing on this war with vigor. It is odd enough that the very uh, word was made use of just as it is now. They borrowed a million of pounds of individuals and at the same time imposed taxes upon the whole nation for the purpose of paying the interest of the money so borrowed. Or in other words, the nation's taxes were mortgaged to the lenders of this million of pounds. So there you go. 
that's what the uh, national debt does. The uh, interest that uh, has to be serviced on the debt, the repayment of the debt, that's the mortgage on, on the nation. The lenders of the money who in time became to be called fund holders or stockholders did, as the work of lending and fund making advanced, make their loans in various ways and the bargains between them and the government were of great variety in their terms and in the denominations made use of, but it was always the same thing in effect. The government borrowed the money of individuals. That's what you need to understand about uh, the bond market. That's basically what it is, especially the government bond market. It's just basically the government borrowing money from, uh, from individuals or institutions. It mortgaged taxes for the payment of the interest. And those individuals received for their money promises or engagements no matter in what shape which enable them to demand annually, half yearly, or quarterly the share of interest due to each of them. And any single parcel of interest so received is what is, in the queer language of the funding trade, called a dividend. Nowadays, I guess they call it a coupon as well. No matter, therefore, what the thing is called, no matter how many nicknames they choose to give to the several branches of the debt. We see daily in the price newspapers what is called the price of stocks, as in the following statement, which is in all the newspapers of this day. So he's got a list here, bank stock, 3% uh, RED, 3% consolidated, 4%, 5% navy, long annuities, omnium, exchequer bills, bank stock for open, consoles. So there you go. Basically, they're all loans <laughs> that, that the government took. It, it, it's uh, another way of keeping uh, the public from understanding things. These are the names which the dealers or jobbers in stocks or stockbrokers nowadays give to the several classes of them. But as I said before, let us avoid confusing our heads with the worse than Babylonish collection of names or sounds and keep fully and clearly and constantly in our sight these plain facts. First, that the funds, the stocks, and the national debt all mean one and the same thing. Secondly, that this debt is made up of the principal money lent to the government at different times since the beginning of the thing in 1692. So there you go. Uh, the accumulated debt of the United Kingdom started in 1692. Thirdly, that the interest upon this principal money is paid out of taxes. And fourthly, that the persons who are entitled to receive this interest are what we call fund holders or stockholders, or according to the more common notion and saying, have money in the funds. Yeah, have money in the funds. That's an important term uh, as we go forward. Being here in the elementary, the mere horn book part of our subject, we cannot make the matter too clear to our comprehension, and we ought by no means to go a step further till we have inquired into the sense of this saying about people's having money in the funds, from which anyone who did not understand the thing would naturally conclude that the person who made use of the saying, looked upon the funds as a place where a great quantity of gold and silver was kept locked up in safety. Well, gold and silver, of course, are money. Nor would such conclusion be very erroneous, for generally speaking, the notion of the people of this country is that the funds or the stocks 
they are made use of indiscriminately is a place where money is kept, a place indeed of a sort of mysterious existence, a sort of financial arc, a place not perhaps to be touched or even seen, but still the notion is that of a place, and a place too of more than mortal security. Uh, Billy has just got up here. <laughs> Alas, the funds are no place at all. And indeed, how should they, seeing that they are in fact one and the same thing with the national debt? But to remove from the mind of every creature all doubt upon this point, to dissipate the mists in which we have so long been wandering about to the infinite amusement of those who invented these terms. Let us take a plain common sense view of some of these uh, loaning transactions. Let us suppose then that the government wants a loan, that is, wants to borrow money to the amount of a million pounds. Billy, sit down. Come on, good boy. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, it gives out its wishes to this effect, and after the usual ceremony upon such occasions, the loan is made. That is, the money is lent by Messrs. Muckworm and Company. So that's the bank, Messrs. Muckworm and Company. We shall see by and by when we come to talk more fully upon the subject of loans, what sort of a way it is in which Muckworm pays in the money so lent, and in what sort of money it is that he pays. But for the sake of simplicity in our illustration, we will suppose him to pay in real good money. Well, that's gold and silver. And pay the whole million himself at once. Well, what does Muckworm get in return? Why, his name is written in a book. Against his name is written that he is entitled to receive interest for a million of money. Which book is kept at the bank company's house or shop in Threadneedle Street, London? And thus it is that Muckworm puts a million of money into the funds. Well, you will say, but what should become of the money? Why the government expends it? To be sure, what should become of it? Very few people borrow money for the purpose of locking it up in their drawers or chests. What? Then the money all vanishes and nothing remains in lieu of it but the lender's name written in a book? Even so, this, my good neighbors, is the way that money is put into the funds. But the most interesting part of the transaction remains to be described. Muckworm, who is as wise as he is rich, takes special care not to be a fund holder himself. Well, they are the bankers. Uh, they take a cut from uh, the loan and they sell it on, as you'll see here. And as is always the case, he loses no time in selling his stock. That is to say, his right to receive the interest of the million of pounds. These funds or stock, as we have seen, have no bodily existence, either in the shape of money or of bonds or certificates of anything else that can be seen or touched out of thin air. They have a being merely in name. They mean, in fact, a right to receive interest. And the man who is said to possess or to have a thousand pounds worth of stock possesses in reality nothing but the right of receiving the interest of a thousand pounds. When therefore Muckworm sells his millions worth of stock, he sells the right of receiving the interest upon the million of pounds which he lent to the government. But the way in which sales of this sort are affected is by parceling the stock out to little uh, purchasers, every one of whom buys as much as he likes. He has his name written in the book, for so much instead of the name of Muckworm and Company, and 
And when Muckworm has sold the whole, his name is crossed out, and the names of the persons to whom he has sold remain in the book. And here it is that the thing comes home to our very bosoms. For our neighbor, Farmer Greenhorn, who has all his life long been working like a horse in order to secure his children from the perils of poverty, having first bequeathed his farm to his son, sells the rest of his property, amounting to a couple of thousand pounds, and with the real good money, gold and silver, the fruit of his incessant toil and care, purchases 2,000 pounds worth of muckworms, funds, or stocks, and leaves the said purchase to his daughter. And why does he do say? The reason is that as he believes his daughter will always receive the interest of the 2,000 pounds without any of the risk or trouble belonging to the rent of house or land. Thus, neighbor Greenhorn is said to have put 2,000 pounds in the funds, and thus his daughter, poor girl, is said to have her money in the funds. When the plain fact is that Muckworm's money has been spent by the government, that Muckworm has now the 2,000 pounds of poor Grizzle Greenhorn, and she in return for it has her name written in a book at the bank company's house in Threadneedle Street, London, in consequence of which she is entitled to receive the interest of these 2,000 pounds, which brings us back to the point whence we started and explains the whole art and mystery of making loans and funds and stocks and national debts. It will be very useful to show the effect of this, putting money into the funds with respect to the party who is said to put it in. I do not know of any duty more pressing upon me than that of showing in this plain and practical way what we have been, what are and what must be the consequences to those who thus dispose of their property, especially if they have no property of any other sort. But this will be found to belong to another part of our subject. And as we have now seen what the funds and stocks really are, as we have blown away the mist in which we had so long been wandering, as the financial ark is now no more in our sight than any veritable box made of deal boards and nails, as we are now satisfied that there is nothing mystical in the words, funds and stocks, and that so far from meaning a place where a great quantity of money is kept, they are not the name of any place at all, nor of anything which has a corporeal existence and are the mere denominations or names of several classes or parcels of that. Well, nowadays they call uh, stocks equity, but uh, corporations as well. You put your money into the uh, stock. That money is spent already. So, and, and also if you buy bonds, uh, you're not, you don't own anything. You've just uh, given the money or lent the money to the government. And people now are paying the government to borrow money f from them. That's even more crazy. I can only wonder what William Cobbett would have thought of that 210 years ago, which the government owes to individuals. That's the debt, of course. In short, as we have now, let us hope, arrived at a complete knowledge of the nature and origin of the funds. I guess you could say uh, nowadays you could replace that for guilt or treasuries. I've got my money in treasuries or I got my money in guilt. That's the same thing as funds. And the stocks and the national debt, which, as we before said, are in fact all one and the same thing. It is time that we proceed to inquire into their progress. 
and to see how that progress is connected with the increase of the bank notes and with the stoppage of the payments of those notes in gold and silver. To do justice, however, to this copious and interesting theme, especially when coupled with what will be necessary to say as to the schemes for arresting the progress of the debt, will demand a separate letter. In the meanwhile, I am with perfect sincerity, your friend, William Cobbett, State Prison, Newgate, Thursday, 6th of September, 1810. That was the second letter explaining what the terms mean. Funds, stocks, national debt. For today, you can replace them for treasuries, gilt, national debt, uh, or bonds. They're all loans to governments. Uh, yeah, and uh, the only way you can lend to them, of course, is if you earn the fiat currency. Of course, we don't lend them gold and silver anymore, but we still have to work or toil, as he said in, in this uh, letter, to save the money or the fiat money. Uh, we still have to work in order to, to lend to the government. And uh, the government has already spent it <laughs> and is getting even worse now. Uh, the government is overspending to a huge degree. So those people who think it's safe to... Um, I, I won't even say money anymore because we are not lending money anymore because we're not lending gold and silver. We're lending uh, our efforts, though. Because that's what money usually represents, even though we use fiat currency. So I hope you enjoyed the second letter. I apologize uh, for my reading. There is a printing statement here in the beginning of the book. And it says, due to the very old age and scarcity of this book, many of the pages may be hard to read due to the blurring of the original text. Possible missing pages, missing text dark backgrounds and other issues beyond our control. Because this is such an important and rare work, we believe it is best to reproduce this book regardless of its original condition. Thank you for your understanding. So I think I bought this on eBay, this one. So here's the uh, book again. If you wanna have a look at it, if you're interested in buying it, uh, hopefully um, we'll keep going with these letters. So we've done letter one and two. There's a lot of them uh, to go through, but I think uh, it's getting more and more interesting. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, uh, make sure you hit the like button. Please share it far and wide. Think about subscribing to my channel if you haven't yet. And you can also follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and all these other platforms below here. I wish you all a great uh, rest of the weekend. Take care. Bye.